My name is Jimmy though, I'm one of the pastors on staff here and uh, I always love getting to come share with the young adult group. Um, you guys are a lot of fun and I appreciate you letting me join you this evening. So we're going to be in Ephesians 5 tonight. So if you have your Bibles, you can go ahead and open them to the New Testament book of Ephesians. Um, and we'll, we'll be there in chapter 5. Um, you know, Ephesians for me is one of those books that categorizes as a personal favorite. I, I'm still not sure, to be honest with you, I have a master's degree in theology, and I still can't answer the question of whether or not it's okay to have a favorite book of the Bible. Um, whether or not, you know, you're not supposed to have favorite kids, um, I know that, but favorite book of the Bible, I'm kind of like, eh, depends on what day of the week you catch me. But Ephesians, for many people, is a favorite, and whether or not, you know, whatever, if that's right, wrong, we can apologize to the Lord one day, but we like the book of Ephesians. But, you know, it, it's really a favorite for a lot of people, for that idea, it, it's just got so much practical wisdom in it. I mean, we're here, you know, and, and you guys are here because you like to study the Bible, you want to grow in your walk with Jesus. Um, and so Ephesians has just some stuff that's really helpful to you um, kind of along the way or as part of your journey. Now, the Apostle Paul who wrote the book of Ephesians, uh, he wrote it obviously to the church, you know, being his primary audience, the church who was in F Ephesus, had an interesting relationship with this group of people who were in Ephesus. When Paul first arrived in Ephesus, it was roughly the year 53 AD, and he was on his um, third of his missionary journeys. Paul took three different missionary journeys around the Mediterranean world. If you remember, you know, Paul um, was a, a Pharisee who persecuted Christians, right? He came to know Jesus on the Damascus Road. You guys can go read Acts chapter 9 later. After that happens, he's going to basically wind up spending uh, about 13 years in kind of relative obscurity before the Lord's going to call him out of the city of Tarsus where he was living and send him out as his witness to the Gentiles. And so that's Acts chapter 13. And what you have in the middle of the book of Acts are these different missionary journeys that Paul goes on. And so he basically goes from the city of um, Antioch, which is kind of uh, modern day Syria. It's on the far uh, eastern coast of the Mediterranean. And he takes these different journeys into mainland Europe. And so it's, it's kind of like each one of them, he goes a little bit further into Europe, he stays a little bit longer, he visits and plants different churches uh, and builds relationships along the way. And so by the time he gets to Ephesus, he's on the third and longest of his missionary journeys. Now his typical MO when he would go to these different places was he would basically you know, follow the Roman roads, right? And he would go along these Roman roads and take you to the next big city. And he would spend anywhere from a couple days to a couple weeks in the different cities. And he basically would go and he would go into the synagogue and um, he would begin to tell people about Jesus. And so whether it was the synagogues or sometimes you know, places that didn't even have necessarily a synagogue, he would just go to wherever anybody would listen, he would tell them about Jesus. But by the time we get then to the uh, uh, chapter 18 and 19 of the book of Acts on his third missionary journey, he rolls into Ephesus and he doesn't stay just for a couple days. Um, he doesn't stay just for a couple weeks like he normally did, but he ends up staying in Ephesus almost two and a half years. Ephesus is one of these places where Paul begins to put down, if you will, some roots. He develops relationships. He gets to really know the people there. In fact, he has such a heart for the Ephesian people that um, about 10 years later, he's going to be away, but he has, there's ha they're having some problems in the church there, and he sends Timothy, who's like his right-hand man. He describes him kind of as his son in the faith. He sends Timothy go to go down and to help deal with and pastor the church in Ephesus. And so he's got this really close relationship with this church, but the Ephesian people, are, um, they're kind of a mixed, mixed bag group of people, um, and it's really kind of an interesting city. Now, um, the city of Ephesus, if you rewind to the first century, was one of the major cities in the Roman Empire. Uh, it's situated kind of where this river comes into the Mediterranean, and so it was a major port of commerce, so lots of money flowing in and out of Ephesus. Um, and so, you know, again, all this kind of immense wealth that would have built up as people tax the import-export in, in Ephesus. Um, it also was a center, a center of culture and of, of kind of the arts. They had this massive theater. Um, it's funny, you can go, not funny necessarily, but you can go read it later. Um, the theater had kind of a bad thing for Paul because there winds up being a riot in the theater. Again, go read Acts chapter 19 about that. But there's a theater there. Um, there's this temple to Artemis, um, the Greek god Artemis, uh, otherwise known as Diana. Um, and, and so there was, they were kind of known for all these different pagan rituals and immorality that went around that. So it's kind of like a mix of like Broadway meets Wall Street meets Las Vegas and kind of put all that together and you basically have a picture of what Ephesus was. And these are the people that Paul's going to decide, I'm going to put down some roots, and I'm going to spend two and a half years of my ministry here, home base in Ephesus, getting to know and love these people. And so 
Those are the people then that he writes later on, a few years later, he writes this book of Ephesians to the church in Ephesus. And so it's helpful to understand a little bit about who they are as he's trying to address some really practical things for them as they're trying to live for Jesus in the midst of this kind of crazy world around them. So after a little bit of a lengthy introduction, what I want to do is read with you um, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1 down through verse 21, and we'll pray and we'll do a a quick Bible study together. So uh, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1, you can follow along. Paul writes, Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be even named among you as is fitting for the saints. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ in God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore do not be partakers with them. Verse 8. You were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of these, those things which are done by them in secret. But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light, for whatever make, makes manifest is light. Therefore he says, Awake, you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. Verse 15. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not be drunk on wine, in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God. Well, let's pray and we'll look at this passage together. Lord, we thank you just that we can be here together this evening. We thank you that we can open your word. And we thank you for just the timeless and immensely practical message of Ephesians chapter 5. And so, Lord, we pray that as we unpack this passage of Scripture together, that you would just meet us here. Lord, we ask that you would help it uh, just to not be head knowledge, but that you would use it to grow us and to transform us more into your image today, Lord. So we invite you here to this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, um, you know, we see here in in just verse 1 of chapter 5 this phrase where he says, be imitators. And I never really appreciated this directive until having kids. You know, anyone who's ever spent any time around kids gets this. Now, I have uh, two kids at home. I have a three-year-old daughter named Haven, and I have another daughter, Piper. We call her Pippi. Um, and she's going to be one on Thursday. So if you think about it on Thursday, happy birthday to Pippi, right? She's going to be very excited. She's going to eat cake. Um, it's going to be wonderful for her. And her older sister will steal all of her presents. Um, so you can pray for us on Thursday evening. But anyways, so parenting two little girls, I've learned a lot about what it means for people to be imitators. I mean, when you take a minute and think about it, everything they understand about the world around them, they've learned from watching my wife Amy and I. They've learned how to speak or how to talk by listening to us speak to them. They've learned how to interact with others by watching us relate. They learned what is they've learned what's right and wrong by watching the example we set. You know, and it's amazing how quickly they pick up on things. I mean, you've really got to be on your guard as a parent because they pick up the good things and you know they pick up the bad things. You know, again, I mentioned we we, uh, call my youngest uh, year old daughter uh, Pippi. And so she started walking when she was nine months old. And she's like the busiest little person ever. She kind of looks like a penguin as she shuffles along. And so you'll see her just like milling about the house and she gets into the cabinets and everything. And so we're constantly saying, no, Pippi. And I feel bad because she's going to think her name is no. She doesn't realize her name is Pippi. She just hears no. So we're working on that. But I've heard Haven start to say, no, Pippi, no, Pippi. You know, it's like, okay, no, no, leave that to mom and and dad to do. We we don't need you to discipline her. But it was so interesting today. um, I won't tell you all these stories about my kids all night. You guys are great. He's already on to his kids. Um, But my three-year-old, it's like, it's amazing the things that become a meltdown, right? So we're, we're, it's like lunchtime. And um, she had a wonderful lunch and she wants a snack. 
And so I'm like, okay, we've got pretzels, we've got popcorn, we've got like a million and one things. No, I don't want it, I don't want it, I don't want it. And next thing I know, she's like screaming and melting down on the floor. And so I'm trying to do the good dad thing, right? I'm like, I'm meeting her in this moment and I'm like, Haven, you know, it's not acceptable for you to act this way. And, um, and she, she yelled something at me, just, ah, you know, just, she's just worked up, right? And so she yells something, I said, Haven, you can't speak to Dada that way, right? I'm like trying to teach her. And so anyways, we get through this moment and she, she's happy, it's all good. And I'm like patting myself on the back for job well done. She's got her popcorn now. She walks out of the kitchen and she, buys, she turns around and she goes, um, and by the way, um, you can't speak to me that way, thanks. <laughs> and just walks away and says, like, what do you do with that? You know, I'm like, literally, she's like, she's like, she learned from me. She learned exactly what to say. And so just that idea of like, man, they learn how to imitate the good things and the bad things. And so I, I just decided, you know, I'll just go to Young Adults tonight and leave my wife to figure that out. <laughs> um, but, you know, just that idea of we want to imitate. And the reality for us as Christians when we think about that, and the charge that Paul gives to the Ephesians is the one that we want to imitate is Jesus himself. Now, I like how it says there, be imitators of God. Again, we understand that Jesus is God, but sometimes the use of the idea of the name of God, you think about God being the Father, and it's kind of like a kid imitating, imitating your father. So I like that he uses God there, but we want to imitate the person of Jesus. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews that um, it says, in these last days, he, that's God, that he's spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things. The, the message that it's saying there in Hebrews is the idea that like everything God wanted to say, everything God wanted to convey to us, he did it in the person of Jesus. And so the perfect example for us to follow, the ones that we want to be imitators of, is none other than Jesus himself. The reality is that Jesus lived life. He set the example of life exactly as it was meant to be lived. He lived life exactly as it was meant to be lived. You know, everybody's got their own idea of how they should go about ordering their day, what life should look like. But, you know, ultimately what we as Christians have to do is we've got to check our own ideas at the door and say, what can I learn? How can I be an imitator of Jesus? So that's what I want to unpack tonight. If I wanted to give you like a theme of the evening, it's how do we imitate Jesus? Jesus. Now, when you look at this passage here in Ephesians 5, Paul uses three different words, or uh, one word three different times in chapter 5 that's kind of helpful for us to cue off of. It's the word walk. If you guys have it there in your New King James Bible, it's the word walk. In an NIV Bible, it says live. But it's the Greek word peripateo. Um, it's a compound word, but um, the preposition peri means like around or concerning, and pateo means to walk. And basically what it means if you put it together is it means to walk around or to walk concerning. And it's the idea of to walk circumspectly. If you wanted to kind of phrase it this way, you could. You could say it's to regulate the pace of one's walk. You want to regulate the pace of your walk according to another standard. And the idea is that we regulate the pace of the walk of our lives in accordance with the example of Jesus. Now, maybe you're here tonight, and maybe you're here and you're just, you know, you're feeling a little burnt out on life. Maybe you're here tonight and you're a little bit frustrated. Maybe you're here and you're, you're dealing with this, you know, same cycle of life you feel like you can't get out of. Maybe you feel like everything is just a fight and it's like, does it really have to be that way? Tonight, what I want to ask you to do as we look through this list of things is examine how it is you're walking and see how does that match up with the way of Jesus. So I'm going to give you three things tonight we're going to look at quickly from this passage. If you're taking notes, the first thing we see is in verse 1 and 2. It's that you should walk in love. Walk in love. Look with me again at Ephesians chapter 5 verse 1. It says, therefore, be imitators of God as dear children, verse 2, and walk, that's the idea of walk circumspectly, walk in love as Christ has also loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. Now, the preeminent uh, you know, trait of the Christian walk could be described as being love. I mean, the directive here is pretty straightforward. Because Christ loved us, so we should love one another because Christ walked in love. So we too should walk in love. And I think, again, this could be a whole sermon in and of itself, but there's just a couple quick things I want to point out. You see that love here in this passage is qualified two different ways. There's kind of two different aspects of love that's highlighted. The first thing is that love is sacrificial or that we should love sacrificially. And again, if you look with me at verse two, notice some of these key words. 
Again, it says, in walk in love as Christ also has loved us. And you can circle this word, given himself for us. As an offering, you can circle the word offering. And a sacrifice, you can circle the word sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling aroma. Again, given, offering, sacrifice. What you see here is this idea of love that costs something. Love that costs something. And this is the heart of the gospel message, right? For God so loved the world that he gave. The whole idea of, of love as presented in the person of Jesus is love that comes at a cost. It's self-sacrificing love. And as Christians, we should commit to the idea of love at a cost too. It's love that, that it's the idea of living sacrificially for those around us, living sacrificially towards God and others. And by the way, this is a key to all healthy relationships. If you know, you, you can't have a loving relationship with another person that's completely one sided. It's all about me, 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 me. But to have a truly loving relationship with another, another person, it's got to be a, a relationship that's built around sacrificial love. And so love should be sacrificial. But the other way that we should walk in love is to love purely, to love purely. Look with me down at verse three for just a minute. Verse three says, but fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be even named among you as is fitting for saints. Again, this could be a whole study in and of itself, but you know, basically what he's saying here, it's like you could you know, maybe just describe it as like no funny business. Um, there's a little more to it, but you know, fornication is the idea of sexual immorality. Um, and, 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 you know, the point is that love that's characterized by immorality or by dishonesty or greed is no love at all. Love that's characterized by immorality or dishonesty or greed is no love at all. And I wanted to bring this up tonight because I want to say this. Maybe you're here tonight and this is you. Maybe it's nobody in the room, but maybe you're here tonight and, and you know, you you can identify with one of those things, immorality, dishonesty, or greed. Uh, maybe you're in a relationship that's characterized by one of those, the, one of those things and you justify it under the guise of, well, we love each other. We love each other. Love that's characterized by immor immorality is no love at all. And you have to understand that. But true love is characterized by sacrifice and by purity. And so that brings us to the next one on our list. Not only should we walk in love, but we also should walk in light. Look with me a little bit further down at verse 8. It says, For, once, um, for you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. And I really enjoy when I read this passage how spatial the language is here. I mean, there's a, a, a dichotomy that illustrates a pretty good contrast. It's the idea of that, like, once he said that you were darkness, you lived in darkness. But now you live in light. You used to do these shameful things. If you read further down, verse 12 uses the word, it describes these deeds of darkness as being these shameful deeds. It says you used to do these shameful things that were done in secret. But now you live in light before the Lord. And you walk with these characteristics of light. You know, when you lived in darkness, you were characterized by bondage. But life and light is characterized by freedom. And we see this beautiful contrast that's drawn there. And you think about it just in your own life for just a minute. I mean, you know, before you come to know Christ, you live in darkness. The Bible says that's what Jesus said in John chapter 3. He said, men love darkness because their deeds are evil. It's like the reality of a world apart from Christ is people that live in darkness. They love darkness. They love to hide their shameful deeds. But it's a life that's characterized by bondage. But once you put on the new self, you come into relationship with Jesus Christ, no longer do you positionally live in darkness, but you're transferred to the kingdom of light, the Bible says in Ephesians. And that basically our standing before God is we, we live in the light as he is in the light. And it, I like how in verse 8 it describes this walk a little bit further. Again, look with me at verse 8. It says, walk as children of light, and then a parenthetical note there, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. It's like a life that is characterized by walking in the light is a life that is full of goodness and full of righteousness and full of truth. There's a pretty good litmus, litmus test, right, to look in the mirror and say, is my life characterized by goodness, what's intrinsically good and valuable? Is my life characterized by righteousness, a love for what's right? And is it characterized by truth? And as Christians, we are to no longer have any fellowship with darkness. Let me read to you from Mark chapter 4. Mark 4.22 says, For there is nothing hidden which will not be revealed, nor has anything been kept secret, but that it should come to light. 
And 1 John 1, 7 says, but if we, uh, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sins. I mean, what an awesome reality that is for us as people who have faith in Jesus Christ, that we can live in the light. And the result of that light is we have fellowship one, with one another, First John says, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sins. I mean, there's an incredibly freeing reality that comes to living in life. And again, maybe you're here tonight, and maybe there's something in your life that you'd prefer to hide in darkness. You know it's there. Maybe nobody else does. Maybe it's something that you've successfully been able to maneuver in such a way that nobody, no, it feels like nobody else knows. The Bible says that everything is open and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Again, that verse in Mark says that there's nothing that's kept secret that should not come to light. So it's like the, the most freeing, wonderful thing you can do as a believer is just to bring stuff into the light and then allow the blood of Jesus Christ to, to cleanse us from all sins. And so we want to walk in the light. And, you know, one thing that's important, I think maybe a great practical way to think about that, it's the idea of keeping a short account with God. You guys, uh, again, if you've been a Christian for any time, you maybe understand the reality that, you know, when you come to faith in Jesus Christ, the Bible says that you're justified. That means that you're put in right standing before God. The Bible describes it a lot of different ways. You're born again, right? You put on the new self. It's a spiritual rebirth. There's a lot of different phrases we use to describe it, but it means you're in right standing with God. The theological term is you're justified. But it begins the process then of what the Bible describes as your sanctification. And this is the working out of holiness in your Christian life. This is the process that begins to happen. The reality is that as you go through your Christian life, you're never going to be sinless until one day you stand before the Lord in heaven, but hopefully you sin less along the way. And as this process happens, we understand there's a reality of remaining sin. It's not to excuse sin or to have a license to go on sinning, but we understand that's a reality for people, um, you know, this side of this side of heaven. The best thing we can do as believers is to keep a short account with the Lord. When there's a moment of sin or weakness and failure that's, that's at your door, you want to be quick not to hide it, but just to bring it to the Lord. Bring it into the light. You know, have people around you who encourage you. Bring things into the light. Keep a short account with the Lord and then allow the blood of Jesus Christ just to cleanse you from all sin. That's one of those things, man, it's so important for just growing in maturity and living a life that's characterized by freedom and peace and joy before the Lord, because darkness doesn't bring any of those things. Um, I did want to highlight one more um, just kind of sub point of this idea of walking in light. Look with me at verse 11 for just a second. There's something that stood out to me for just a minute, and I wanted to point out to you guys. Verse 11, it says, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. You know, as Christians, we have the responsibility to stand up for what is right. I do think, you know, there's a fear where people have taken this concept maybe too far to the extremes, but I think the simple principle is this, that as believers, we need to be committed to not turning a blind eye when evil confronts us. When you have the opportunity to do good, do it. When you have the opportunity to stand up for what is right, do it. When you have the chance to, you know, point the world to something that's in accordance with what God's truth is, do it. We've got to be bold. We've got to be courageous as people. We live in a world that, um, look, is, you guys know this, it, it, it has no respect for what God says is right and what God says is wrong. And we've got to be the voice of truth and we've got to stand up for these things. And so, you know, just that idea of like um, having nothing to do with the un unfruitful words of darkness but be committed to exposing them. That's an important thing for us as believers. So number one on the list was walk in love. Number two on the list was walk in light. Number three on the, on the list is walk in wisdom. Look with me down at verse 15 of Ephesians 5. Verse 15 says, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise. Do you guys remember the story in um, 1 Kings chapter 3 of Solomon? Solomon was a young man. He becomes king over Israel after his father David. And God appears to him and he basically says to him, ask for me whatever you want and I'll grant it to you. Can you imagine that? God shows up on your doorstep and says, whatever you want. And Solomon thinks about it and it's amazing what he says. He says, um, he asks that God would give him a wise and discerning heart that he would govern his people well. 
And the Bible says that God was so pleased with that request that God granted him a wise and discerning heart. God, God, God made him wiser than anybody else ever was. That God gave him a wise and discerning heart. And then beyond that, he blessed him materially and abundantly in, in just incredible ways. But God was pleased with that request that Solomon had for a wise and discerning heart. What a thing for us to pray for, that we would be people who would have a wise and discerning heart. You know, we live in a world, again, it, it's a world that requires wisdom. There are circumstances that we face today that are really hard to know how to navigate. And we need the wisdom from heaven to know what to do. Now, I really like it here because um, this makes Bible teaching really easy when you have passages like this. Um, as we finish out this section of Ephesians 5, there's basically six characteristics of wisdom. So what I want to do, again, as we close is give you, as you think about walking in wisdom, here's a couple other things along the way, six characteristics of wisdom that help you, you know, maybe as a bit of a self-test or self-evaluation of how do I do along the way. So um, you're either going to have to take notes or go back and listen to it later or ask your friend. But let me give you quickly six characteristics of wisdom as we look at these final verses in Ephesians 5. Number one on the list, wisdom makes the most of every opportunity. It makes the most of every opportunity. Look with me at verse 15. Paul writes this, again, see then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. So again, that idea of wisdom, verse 16, redeeming the time because the days are evil Therefore, do not be unwise. Notice that phrase there again, redeeming the time because the days are evil. You know, um, so the solution to a busy life isn't more time. Time is one of the greatest resources that all of us are given. And the crazy thing is we're given it in equal proportion, right? I mean, you think about other gifts, right? People are giving gifts in vary varying dispensations. Some people are smarter than other people. It's just a reality. Some people are more likable than other people. Some people are funnier than other people. There, you know, many gifts are given in dispensations in differing amounts. But what we're all given equally is time. Everybody has 24 hours in a day. And the natural thing about time, time does not naturally trend itself towards a good use of itself, right? Time left just to its own devices. And again, that's, what, that's why the Bible says here that we've got to redeem it because the days are evil. The natural res result of unstructured, unstewarded time is it's going to be an evil result. And so as Christians, we've got to be really intentional about stewarding well the time that we've been given. How do we make the most of every opportunity? Guys, this means that we need to be intentional about, you know, carving out, again, I'm glad you're here tonight, time for the Lord and for fellowship with other believers. It means that we need to be, you know, taking advantage of opportunities to share the gospel with the world around us. And it also means practically we need to not be wasting our time on stupid things. I listened to a, um, a study recently. I can't tell you if what exactly the age was, but it was basically the idea that men, by the time they're either 18 or 20, I don't remember which one, that they've played on average 10,000 hours of video games. Those of you that work like a full-time 40 hour a week job, do you know how many hours you work in a year? Let me tell you, it's 2,080. That's what you work if you work a 40 hour a week job, 2,080. That's roughly five years of full-time work you play by the time you're either 18 or 20 in video games. I mean, come on. It's just like, it's crazy. We've got we've to steward well the time that we've been given. It means we've got to say no to some things. It means that we've got to be intentional about ideas like Sabbath. You know, it's like, again, if God created the world in six days and rested on the seventh, do we think that we're better than him? Do we think that we don't need that? We've got to structure our time wisely. And so we want to make the most of every opportunity. That's the first characteristic of wisdom. Number two on the list, wisdom understands what God's will is. It understands what God's will is. Look with me at verse 17. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. You know, um, I can't think of anybody I've ever met who I you know, would think, man, that's a really wise person who was totally confused or unsure about what God's will for their life was. If you think about it for just a minute, I would imagine the same as, uh, you would say the same thing. It's like most people who you'd characterize as wise, it, it, they have a clarity about where, you know, what God has for them and what it means to follow them or follow him. Romans 12, verse 2 and 3 um, says, Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. You find God's will by seeking him. So wisdom understands God's will. Number three on the list, wisdom is filled with the Spirit. Look with me at verse 18. It says, And do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, 
but be filled with the Spirit. Again here, he draws a practical contrast, and he was speaking to the Ephesians who had a little bit of an issue um, with the wine. Um, but he's drawing a contrast, and he's basically saying is, if you get drunk on wine, you're under the influence of wine. But rather than being under the influence of wine, you want to be under the influence of the Holy Spirit. And we see a contrast there. And I, I really, you know, there's an interesting um, phrase here in the original language. It says in, um, in your Bible, it says, but be filled with the Spirit. In the original Greek language of the New Testament, the, the phrase be filled there is a present passive imperative. Um, and basically what that means is, is it's an ongoing reality uh, that's, that's like a command. A present tense is something that's ongoing, so it's got to happen again and again and again. It's like we regularly need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. That it's passive, that it's something that we ask for and God does to us. He does for us. And then it's an imperative. It's a command. It's a necessity for successfully navigating life, that we need that constant refilling of the Holy Spirit. And man, that should be a prayer for each one of us. As we're praying for wisdom, we should be continually praying that God would fill us afresh each day with His Holy Spirit. So wisdom number three on the list there was wisdom is filled with the Spirit. Number four, a characteristic of wisdom, is wisdom encourages others. Look with me at verse 19. It kind of picks it up mid-sentence. It says, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. You know, wisdom encourages others because you can share with others the joyous song of your heart. This is why we share testimony sometimes. We share just a story of what God's done in our lives. And it's important for us as people to share the goodness of the Lord, the goodness of what He's done in our lives with others for the purpose of encouraging them and pointing them to Him. Number five on the list, wisdom always gives thanks. Look with me at verse 20. It says, give thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Give thanks. You know, as people, we should give thanks in all circumstances. We should give thanks in all seasons for the big things and for the little things. And, you know, I think one of the wonderful things about giving thanks and being intentional about giving thanks is, man, it builds contentment in our lives. Again, in the same way I've never met a wise person who was unsure of God's will for their life, I've never met a wise person who was discontent. It's like when we want to develop a place of contentment in our lives, that begins by developing an attitude of thanksgiving, that wisdom always gives, gives thanks to the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And number six on the list, just characteristics of wisdom, is wisdom submits to one another. Look with me again at verse 21. It says, submitting to one another in the fear of God. You know, that idea of submission, again, a whole Bible study could be taught on that. It's the Greek word hupotasso. It means to, to fall in line or to fall in rank. If you think about like a military and somebody falls in rank, they, they fit in where it is they're supposed to be as part of the team. And I think that's a good way to think about it here. It's like, are you willing to put yourself aside for just a minute? Put aside your own, uh, your own selfish interests. Put aside your own you know, focus on self. And are you willing to be a team player? Are you willing to look past something that's in your own best interest? Are, are you willing to not be the proverbial bull in the china shop? But how do I just come alongside and help and, and, and be involved as a team member with other people? Am I committed to following the example of Christ this way? I mean, think about Jesus, right? He didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Think about just the, you know, the illustration of when he went and washed the disciples' feet. It's like he was willing to submit to one another. And in the same way, we should be people who are characterized by mutual submission out of love and respect and the ability to be agreeable and work alongside other people. And so six characteristics of wisdom. It makes the most of every opportunity. It understands God's will. It's filled with the Spirit. It encourages others. It always gives thanks. And it submits to one another. I hope for you guys, that, again, you know, Ephesians 5 is one of those chapters that's immensely practical. And I hope it's a place you can go to time again. But, you know, just a reminder for us that out of all the things in this world we could choose to imitate, let's be imitators of Christ. Let's be people who are committed to walking in love, to love sacrificially. Let's be people who want to just walk in the light. We keep a short account with the Lord. We don't, we don't want to hide in darkness. We don't want to hide deeds in darkness, but we just want to live in, in, in light and invite others to do the same. We want to expose the shameful deeds of darkness. And then we also want to be people who are characterized by wisdom. Characterized by wisdom. You know, somebody that others would be able to come to and ask advice and you can point them towards the Lord. 
Um, and you know, it, it's the life that's a life of love and a life that's lived, that walks in light and a life that's characterized by wisdom. It's a life that it's at peace and it's at rest and at joy with the Lord. So that's my prayer for myself today. That's my prayer for you guys. And I hope that encourages you tonight with Ephesians chapter five. Would you pray with me? Lord, we thank you that we can just be here together tonight. We thank you for the message of Ephesians chapter five. And God, I pray that you'd help us to be people who um, regulate our walk according, according to the example of how you lived. Lord, we wanna, we wanna do like Paul said, we wanna join with others in following your example. So help us to do that, Lord. Help us to walk not as unwise, but as wise. Help us to walk in light. Help us to walk in love. Lord, help us not to um, ever uh, turn back into darkness. Lord, help us to put off the old self and to put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge and the image of its creator. So Lord, we ask that you would do these things in us. We know that we want to do the best we can to, to act, to do these things, but we also acknowledge we need your help. So God, I pray for everybody here. Lord, that you would strengthen them by the power of your Holy Spirit to be able to live lives, to walk in a way that's pleasing to you, Lord, that they would be a wonderful testimony to the world around them of your love and your wonderful, transforming, redeeming grace. God, we thank you for loving us. We thank you for dying on the cross for us. We thank you for doing for us what we could never do for ourselves. And we pray that you'd watch over us till we come together again. In Jesus' name, amen.